Uh, I'm Jennifer Loon, uh, State Representative from Eden Prairie and Chair of the Education Finance Committee. So I'll, I'll kick this off and uh, I'm just gonna make a few very brief remarks, just kind of a top line uh, rundown of some of the supplemental spending provisions that are in uh, the bill that we'll be hearing on the House floor later today. And then uh, uh, Representative Erickson, the Chair of the Policy Committee, will be talking about the policy uh, provisions in the bill and then we'll turn it over to uh, Chair Nornis of the Higher Ed. Uh, provisions and uh, and then we'll be happy to take any questions and of course if the speaker and majority leader have something they want to say now. We think you're doing a wonderful job. <laughs> all right thanks <laughs> they'll be here for questions as well so um, as you all may know um, you know we uh, all committees received a target that they're working from um, the education finance committee uh, received a zero target but we do have some money that we're able to repurpose from um, a loan program that a few districts have is something called the maximum effort loan program and we are allowing the opportunity for those districts if they wish to to get out of those loans uh, to do a local bond and uh, repay the state in many cases the interest rates that they're paying uh, and that are higher than they could get uh, right now and so the money that comes into the state if they opt to do that um, allows us to repurpose about uh, it's gonna be about $55 million overall in the bill. And so we put that money to really good use in um, a few key areas. Um, and a lot of similarities to things you may have already seen in the governor's supplemental um, spending proposal in the area of trying to address teacher shortages and also diversifying our teaching ranks. Um, we've got a number of um, uh, student loan forgiveness programs, um, some incentive tuition incentive programs for um, people who go into teaching uh, and teaching preparation programs. Um, also some specific programs uh, that school districts and, and others have embarked on called Grow Your Own. So they may have staff that are paraprofessionals or others that would like to become teachers and so there's gonna be some, some grant money to help that happen. Um, we will also be um, providing some about $16.8 million in grants to provide enhanced student support services and teacher training in some critical areas. So uh, $5 million in um, grants to schools for mental health services, uh, $2.75 million for uh, a program called Be Positive Behavioral Intervention and Supports. This is a program that many of our districts have entered into and we want to allow others to do so. And it's really um, proven to be uh, very effective in districts that have fully embraced it and, and trained their teaching staff in how to diffuse some situations uh, with students and redirect um, uh, student behavior in, in positive ways. Um, we also have um, $6 million of training for um, professional staff in our intermediate districts and co-ops. Um, and these are uh, intermediate districts and the co-ops uh, that do the same type of uh, arrangements is for what we call level four uh, special education students. And these are students really with their highest needs uh, on that special education ranking. And also students with some very severe emotional um, behavioral disorders. And uh, those uh, intermediate schools are really crying out for help for more training for those teachers. So we provide $6 million in grants for those. Um, a few other things that we do uh, to try to um, help our districts across the state. We want every child, no matter where they live, to have a great uh, opportunity to get a world-class education. But we do have some disparities that exist in how we fund districts, depending on where a school is located. Currently, we have something called the equity revenue bump, where uh, schools in the metro area get a 25% increase in their equity revenue just because they're in the metro area. Um, and we find that a lot of uh, school districts outside of the metro really could um, really need uh, that, that equity in treatment and to be able to meet the needs of their students. So we offer an opportunity for all districts to participate in that program. We pay for it all. It's an aid and levy program. We pay for it all the first year in fiscal year 17. It's about $7.7 .7 million. In fiscal year 18, if the school districts want to continue to participate and, and have that part of the levy a portion kick in, then a school district must have a vote of the school board to affirmatively opt into that program at a public meeting where public input would be allowed. 
Uh, we do $7 million in broadband grants, and many of you were at the broadband uh, press conference when we talked a little bit about those initiatives uh, to help our schools and students have access to broadband and to internet. Uh, we continue to support early childhood education. Uh, we support uh, some increased funding for Parent Aware, which is, of course, the voluntary rating system. Uh, it's really an affirmation of quality for early childhood providers, and we want to make sure that we have opportunities for more providers to get into that network. Um, high quality rated providers are eligible to uh, accept students on scholarships, and that's the, the program structure that's been established for um, to try to get more of our high need students into a quality early childhood program so that they can be uh, prepared to enter kindergarten uh, successfully and a successful launch to uh, their schooling. Um, we also uh, do some additional grants and helps for career and technology um, of uh, preparation of our students as well as adult education. So there's some grants for uh, an innovative program where we're gonna put um, some technology for students in a van and it will travel around to uh, school districts so they can share that equipment uh, amongst several districts, a Representative Keels initiative. Um, we're gonna increase funding for adult basic education by about $400,000 and also provide for free GED testing uh, per the governor's initiative for fiscal year 17. So um, as I mentioned, a lot of common ground here with the governor and some other additional things that I think we're gonna help uh, encourage hopefully more people to go into teaching to help alleviate those shortages, encourage more diversity in our teaching ranks, and also help deal with some of the um, support services that our schools are telling us they need, particularly in the area of mental health. Representative Sandra Erickson, uh, representing a part of East Central Minnesota, uh, particularly the uh, Lake Mille Lacs area. And in keeping with the goals of the finance uh, bill that you've just heard from Representative Loon, our policy, our innovation policies also empower our schools and empower our parents without any mandates. Uh, one of our priorities is to elevate the Minnesota Comprehensive Assessment so that our Minsk system will take a look at those uh, proficiency scores and value those as ways for our students to succeed in college and to avoid remediation to the greatest extent possible. We also have in our Innovation Policy Bill a jump start on evaluating uh, the uh, Board of Teaching and the Licensing Division at the Department of Education in light of the uh, uh, evaluation that was done by the Legislative Office of Auditor. Uh, we have found that we have a broken system, so to speak, and we want to fix that. We need uh, teachers. We need a pair of professionals to take a look at teaching. Uh, we need to refine the licensure pr process for those who are already in our uh, schools. So uh, it's uh, very important to us that we have a study group, a legislative study group that drills down and takes a look at what has happened over the years uh, with the Board of Teaching and the Licensing Division that has placed an impediment in the licensing of our future teachers and our present teachers. We also have a heightened uh, status of security management and access to our student data in our policy bill. We think that's really important in light of the fact that we have so much information today that floats around in our clouds and we want to make sure we protect our student data while we also use our student data to the best of ability to help our students succeed. We also have improvements to the innovation zones, now placing them in education code so that schools can look forward to, in the career technical area, as Representative Loon mentioned, to uh, great futures for our students who need to look at ways to uh, enter the workforce uh, prepared at the high school level through uh, probably a relationship with a uh, business partner and a relationship with our community colleges. And we look forward to that empowering our schools and empowering our parents. And speaking of our parents, uh, we have taken the references to parental rights that are found in the education code and made a parental directory for parents to access all those laws that have been passed over the years that empower them to work with their children and to ensure that they have a successful education career. 
Uh, we also have numerous other items in the policy bill, which uh, you could ask about later, uh, but they're also uh, those pieces that empower our schools and empower our parents without mandates. And with that, I'll turn it over to our higher ed chair, Representative Bud Nornis. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Bud Nornis, Chair of Higher Education. I represent District 8A, which is about half of Otter Hill County. I uh, don't have a lot to say. Our bill was very brief. We had no uh, budget, so there's no spending in this bill. I think if we were to have a theme, it would probably always involve students, and this time I'd say research is probably a pretty uh, accurate description. Um, the part of the bill that I think people will notice the most is the, uh, the fetal tissue research being done at the University of Minnesota and how our bill addresses that. Uh, that has been somewhat controversial. And the bill kind of lays out a procedure and, and ultimately report back to the legislature uh, next session. Uh, the state auditor also will be doing a thorough investigation of that particular research project. Uh, in addition to that, the psychiatric program will also have some additional uh, oversight as, as a result of our bill. Uh, it also clarifies, uh, in, in some other areas, the, the teacher forgiveness program. Um, the number of years that a person can apply for that, it's five. And um, we also have a couple of programs that are fairly innovative, I guess. Uh, one would uh, direct Minsky to develop a program for uh, students that are uh, challenged intellectually or, or physically, uh, and to look at a program that could be established for a, to be a two-year program in up to four of our college sites. They would be entitled to take part in the state grant program. They would pay tuition like other students, and after the two-year uh, completion, receive uh, a certificate to be, I guess, uh, determined at some point. That's probably one of the innovative parts of, uh, of our bill. Uh, a couple of things that are not, uh, you know, really, they probably won't be a headline in your paper, or probably the headline for the leading newscast, but there are some programs already out there talking about teachers and the forgiveness programs. There are some programs out there that are uh, almost secret. And our bill clarifies that those that are in public service, uh, employers that are public service, um, those positions, those employers will be required every year to notify their employees of a possible loan forgiveness program that uh, they might qualify for. So it, it's, um, it's just one of those information pieces that gets kind of uh, missed. And so it's an effort to make sure that those that are potentially eligible for it uh, would be able to hear about it. Those are, I guess, the high points. There's some things that we do for the Office of Fire Education, but they're, they're more uh, almost like bookkeeping. It's not necessarily um, things that the everyday person might be interested in. So. I'll address it if you have some questions. Otherwise, that's probably it for higher education. Representative Williams, can you tell us how you arrived at the $55 million figure? Do you have commitments from districts that they will um, repay the current loans and, and bond? Yeah, um, you know, we have a fiscal note on the proposal, and MMB does actually go through and individually contact districts to find out the likelihood of their um, participation in that loan uh, repayment and refinancing program. So um, about, I'll just in round figures, about 53 million of the 55 million in this bill is from that loan repayment program. And then we also um, recapture some, some appropriations that were done in previous fiscal years that had not been completely acted upon. Uh, and um, and repurpose some of those funds as well. So, but the bulk of the money is is from that maximum effort loan repayment. Representative Norris, does your bill still withhold fifteen million dollars of last year's thirty million dollar appropriation to the university until it 
complies with some changes on fetal tissue research? Uh, no, it does not. It does not. No. Uh, Representative Lou, could you t uh, talk a little bit about the uh, civics test, um, or perhaps uh, Representative Erickson, the civics test requirement, and I, I think it may have been in the policy bill, but curious how uh, that, that will be administered and if it's a firm requirement, because if I read it correctly, it doesn't seem to be necessary for graduation. Well, there are two proposals in our bill for the civics test. One is an encouragement, and the other one is what you're referring to as not a graduation requirement, but more or less a recommendation that our students uh, be able to address the same test that those who apply for naturalization, the citizens test, uh, would, would take if, uh, at, and when they become citizens. Uh, Representative Erdahl is the expert in this area, and uh, we've had a lot of interest, uh, as you know, in uh, ensuring that our students understand the Constitution and understand what it takes to become a citizen. So uh, the proposal that I offered would suggest that Constitution Citizenship Day, which is September 17th officially, but we didn't put a date in the bill, would be a day that our social studies teachers could, or anyone actually in a school district, could focus on uh, the Constitution and on the citizenship uh, aspect and uh, use the test. Uh, Representative Erdahl wants to see it embedded in the social studies curriculum, and it's a really great place to put um, the citizenship test because it is written basically at about a seventh grade level and would be uh, a really a good starting point for our middle schoolers to understand the Constitution and the uh, uh, requirements for becoming a citizen of the United States of America. So embedding it in the social studies standards in a very indiscreet way, as teachers see fit, will work very well. And I think that's what he would say to you, is that it's necessary that we fulfill our standards in our social studies curriculum. The civic standards actually in our social studies curriculum are some of the strongest. So students beginning in kindergarten begin to study uh, civics, and therefore I think by the time their seventh and eighth graders would do very well on this test. Uh, it can get, be given in a variety of languages. That'll be an opportunity. That can be uh, accessed through the website. So there are certainly ways to provide for this without making it a mandate. Representative Moon, could you talk a little more about the school uh, situations part of it, the, the, the diffuse the situations that are potentially hostile? What, 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 explain what that is, that <coughs> portion. Are you talking about the teacher safety portions? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, well, there's two things in the bill, and one is a proposal uh, that is in the policy uh, provisions that Representative Erickson brought to the committee, and that is a working group. Uh, Representative Christensen authored that bill, and it's to create a working group on the topic of school discipline. And, um, and it will have a number of stakeholders that will be included in that. I think it's a great step forward to talk about how schools handle discipline, um, maybe some innovative proposals that are out there. And, um, you know, there's been a lot of concern about whether or not um, uh, certain groups of students, you know, maybe uh, of their ethnic or racial um, parts of groups that are identified, if they're being expelled at higher rates than others, and what is the best method with dealing with inappropriate student behavior. Um, in many cases, teachers are telling us that expulsion is not helpful um, and that uh, finding an alternative to, to try to keep those children in school and work through those behavioral issues to come to a, to a better resolution that they can, um, you know, work on those behavioral issues and become productive members of, of their class and of their school is really the best way to go. So that's the first component. The second component uh, was one that I authored and it has to do with uh, really teacher safety and the teacher's um, really role in being the person that is uh, to maintain sort of order and control of their classroom. And uh, I was approached by teachers who have had very um, unfortunate situations where they've had a very uh, perhaps troubled child in class, have sought help from uh, their administrators and been told that they, they cannot have a child taken out of classroom. And uh, one teacher who came to testify, former teacher in fact, she had to leave uh, the profession because of injuries she sustained by a student. Um, 
felt really like she, she wasn't being supported when she brought to her administrator's attention uh, a very troubled uh, little boy that uh, probably had some severe mental health issues but wasn't able to get him evaluated and that. So um, I provide that uh, the teacher, if they have concerns about the safety of themselves or other students in the classroom, or if there's a level of conduct going on that just really renders them unable to, to continue with um, the lesson that they're teaching, has the ability to have a child removed from the classroom. However, I don't prescribe what happens to that student. I don't prescribe any particular um, discipline matters that should occur. That should be worked out locally. Um, and I know um, there perhaps have been some concerns raised by superintendents and, and other school organizations. And in talking with them, uh, I, I am very clear to point out that um, I don't say that the child must be removed for any particular period of time. Um, I, I could foresee something where it's a five mil minute cooling off period, perhaps a little visit with the principal or something and the child goes back to the classroom. Um, there's a number of ways this can be dealt with, but teachers need to know uh, that the administrators are partnering with them in trying to work on student uh, discipline and behavior issues. And they also need to know that in their professional judgment and wisdom and training, if there's a situation that's occurring where they're not able to uh, ensure the safety of all of the students in that classroom or their own safety, um, they need to have the ability to act and have those actions be respected. Thank you. Thank you.